Good morning or afternoon now that it is. Thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation on a rather cold winter day, hopefully the last one of this season. Although how many weathermen have said that already and jinxed us even further. Uh, we do welcome you to our Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. We will, of course, post this program on the website for everyone's future reference as well. And our internet viewers at any time are welcome to send questions or comments, which we can, of course, forward to speakers, simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion today is James Shirk, our Senior Policy Analyst in Labor Economics in our Center for Data Analysis. Mr. Shirk, who joined Heritage in 2006, researches ways to promote competition and mobility in the workforce instead of erecting barriers preventing workers from getting ahead. His commentary and analysis has appeared in the Washington Post, New York Post, Business Week, and Roll Call. He has been a guest expert on such networks as CNN, CNBC, and Fox News, and he also frequently has testified on labor issues before committees of Congress. He earned his bachelor's degree in economics and mathematics at Hillsdale College, and he received his master's degree in economics with a concentration in econometrics and labor economics from the University of Rochester in New York. Please join me in welcoming James Shirk. James? Well, uh, thank you everyone for uh, braving the uh, cold weather to uh, come out here today. I'm uh, pleased we can uh, host this event. Uh, a lot of people were uh, very surprised uh, to see that uh, the United Auto Workers came up short in their organizing drive in uh, Chattanooga. Now, the union losing an organizing election in the South is, that's fairly standard fare. What was surprising, though, was that in this case, unlike every other previous organizing drive, the management was not trying to persuade the workers uh, not to organize. In fact, there was a, a lot of, uh, uh, well, officially uh, management was neutral. Unofficially, they seemed to be fairly clearly favoring the organizing drive and encouraging their workers to unionize, even inviting union organizers into the plant and giving them free run to make their case to the workers. And yet still the union came up short by a vote of 57 percent, or sorry, 53 percent to 47 percent. And uh, we'd like to uh, have this panel today discuss what are the implications of that? Why did the union lose? What does it mean for the labor movement going forward? And what does that mean for how we should adjust our labor laws? So uh, uh, John already introduced me, but I'm also pleased to be able to introduce our two other panelists. Matt Patterson uh, works for the uh, Center for Worker Freedom at Americans for Tax Reform. And he spent about the, the past year organizing a, a coalition of uh, workers and employees at the uh, Chattanooga plant who did not feel that, uh, despite management's uh, encouragement, that joining the UAW would be uh, the, the best move for them and uh, for their families. And we're also joined by uh, Ray Lajeunesse, who's the vice president at the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation, and before that was a staff uh, attorney uh, with the Legal Defense Foundation. And he spent the, uh, the past uh, 30 years working to help uh, workers exercise their legal rights, rights that uh, in many uh, times that uh, the union movement would prefer they not exercise, but the right to uh, refrain from uh, forming a union and the, uh, the right to, uh, to not collectively bargain if a majority of workers don't want to. And so uh, we're uh, pleased to have this great panel. And uh, Matt, if you would uh, care to uh, just give an overview of uh, what happened and uh, why you think the workers were, uh, were persuaded not to join the union. Thank you for that smattering of applause. <laughs> so what happened in Chattanooga? Um, I guess that's what we're here to talk about. Um, it was a very strange election. It was a very strange year in southeastern Tennessee. Myself, I've never seen anything like this in labor history uh, in all my years of studying these things. And I think my two co-panelists will agree there's a lot of reasons this particular situation is unique. And I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned uh, from both sides on how these things are won and how they're fought. So. Let's just start from the beginning. What is the UAW? Labor union founded in 1935 with the help of Walter Ruther, legendary labor organizer. Uh, the UAW had pretty much organized the entire Detroit auto industry uh, by the end of World War II and began taking over the city of Detroit pretty much as a result of that. The power that the UAW had in the Detroit auto industry from the very beginning gave an intense leverage in the local politics of Detroit and then eventually statewide. 
So you have a really interesting situation where you have a, a city that's basically a one industry town for the past five decades, one union that controls that industry, and then a city that is therefore dependent on that union and that industry to survive. Uh, very interesting situation. Now, the union has been in desperate straits for a while now. You can see since 1979, uh, membership has plummeted 74%. They had about 1.5 million members in 79 at the height, and now they have less than 400,000. That's a, a tremendous slide in such a short amount of time. So why did that happen? Uh, it happened because they cannibalized the Detroit auto industry. It's not that difficult to comprehend. You know, once you cannibalize the industry that you organize, if that industry loses jobs, you lose members. I mean, it's really sort of a, a self-defeating mechanism, if you will. So as a result of the decline of the Detroit auto industry, the United Auto Workers needs new plants and new companies to organize. They know this. They've said as much. Bob King, the current president of the United Auto Workers, has said, we know that's key long-term to the success of our membership. And what they're really looking for, and what Bob King is talking about there, are the plants that have opened up in the southern right-to-work states for the most part. We're talking about Nissan in Mississippi and Tennessee, Volkswagen in Chattanooga, Mercedes in Alabama. These are non-unionized facilities in states that don't have as much of a union presence as the northern industrial states. And they need those. They need those to survive. For the union, this is an existential crisis. They absolutely need to organize a new company. And it's really interesting when you think about it. These companies did not randomly choose these southern right-to-work states. They went there for a reason. You know, Volkswagen opened in Chattanooga because Tennessee is a right-to-work state, and the UAW had a very little presence there, uh, or so we thought <laughs> at the time. Uh, the Chattanooga plant's been there since about 2011. They make the Passat automobile. Uh, there's one production line so far. And that car, by the way, won uh, 2012 Motor Trend Car of the Year, and I hasten to add, without the help of a union at that plant, which is something I told the workers over and over again, who said, you know, we would like a union. I would say, well, you're making an award-winning car without a union. Why would you possibly need a union? But we'll get to that later. So they need these southern plants. They've tried multiple times in Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, and they failed in the past 10 years. The current president of the union, Bob King, he has made a very uh, pointed effort to proclaim the union as, as newer, better, nicer. We're not like the old days where we, we are mean to companies. We want to work with them. So that was his strategy, and he was hoping to get a organized, uh, organized in a southern plant before he steps down in June of this year. Um, and that's why Chattanooga was so important to him personally, in addition to being important to the existence of his union. So historic loss for big labor. Knowing what you know now about how important this was for the union and for the president personally, this, I would say, represents one of the most epic disappointments in the history of labor unions. Not only did the union need this fight, need Chattanooga, they were certain that they had won before it happened. I, my sources were telling me that the union was already celebrating the day, February 14th, before the, the uh, results were announced. Um, they had champagne chilled. They had one speech prepared, according to my sources, which was a victory speech. And when, when they announced that they had lost, they were stunned and furious. Uh, so the mechanics of it break down like this. 1,550 workers about you know, Volkswagen were eligible to vote. So in other words, that means these are the hourly full-time workers that are eligible to vote in these kinds of elections. And the UAW lost 712 to 626, which is not a huge margin. Um, and they lost in spite of, and this is why they were so surprised, in spite of the active assistance of the company to let the union in there. Now, why would a, a company actively assist a union in organizing its facility? That is one of the things that makes this so unprecedented, as James mentioned. For one, the German union that controls the company back in Germany, it's called IG Metall or IE Metall, they have a lot of power. And there was a lot of pressure put on the company from the very top in Germany to let this happen. 
Why would they do that? Why would they care? Well, for one, Bob King, the president of the UAW, has been courting the German Union for years now, traveling to Germany, getting them on board, convincing them this is a good idea to pressure the company to let the UAW in there. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If all other Volkswagen facilities, or most of them, are unionized, IG Metall can't have a non-unionized plant in North America that's successful because that undercuts the very reason for their existence or their very uh, raison d'etre, you might say. So you had the company assisting them because of pressure from their union back home. You had Obama's NLRB assisting the union at every possible term. Try to contain your shock at that. Um, <laughs> So for all those reasons, the union thought they had a, a good chance in Chattanooga, a better chance in Chattanooga than they had had anywhere else, and I thought they were right. Um, so one of the reasons they lost is from, because of the efforts of some groups, including ours, and Right to Work, which is uh, represented here. I started going to Chattanooga about a year ago, uh, before things really started heating up, and I started asking people in the town, what do you think about this UAW? You know, and people didn't really know a lot about the union itself. And what I heard a lot was, well, it's nobody's business. It's not my business. I don't work at the plant, so you know, why should I care? There was not nearly enough debate, I felt, in the public realm about the history of this union and what it had done to other plants, towns, and companies that had organized. So I thought there was room for some uh, additional debate. And that's what we tried to do, the Center for Worker Freedom. So what did that entail? Town halls, public events, billboards, radio advertising, editorials, op-eds, blogging, social media, coalition building, and, and meeting with people. You know, this is what I was going to Chattanooga once a month for a year, and I would just meet with as many people as I could. I'd walk into a restaurant, I'd ask the hostess, what do you think of the UAW? Then I would ask the manager, then I would ask the owner if he was around. I would meet with small groups, big groups, I would just talk. I would listen to the needs of the community and the questions they were asking about this union and what it would mean for them. And then I crafted my messages, my op-eds, et cetera, based on what I was hearing with my meetings for people. And I think that that proved really effective in the end. Because my thinking is this. The workers don't operate in a vacuum. They operate in a community. And the union had complete access to the workers at the plant. We were not allowed to be at the facility. So we took our message to the airwaves, the newspapers, and I thought, you know, if we can put pressure on the workers through their coworkers, their family, their friends, you know, that, that that would create a lot of friction for the union, and I think that that's what happened. So the message that we did with all of this, it was a dual message. One, the UAW bankrupts companies, period. There's a long history <laughs> of that happening. And the union was very furious that we would talk about that. Um, the de decline of General Motors, but also a Volkswagen facility in New Stanton, Pennsylvania, which is a story that not very many people in Chattanooga knew about. It was a plant in the 80s, Pennsylvania, Volkswagen plant operation for about 10 years. And the union got in there, the UAW, and they just instigated strike after strike after strike, something like six strikes in the first 20 months of operation in that Volkswagen facility in Pennsylvania. Now, that plan ended up going out of business. The union says, well, that wasn't our fault. And my point was, well, you didn't help. You know, you certainly increased labor costs, and you certainly made it a less productive operation. So we talked about situations like that. And number two, this union, negotiating wages for workers is only part of what they do. Uh, in a larger sense, they're a very political, very active organization. So made Detroit less profitable. This from Reuters I thought was key, and I, I shared these quotes with as many people as I could. Quote, since 2001, the Detroit Three have slashed over 200,000 jobs. In the same period, foreign automakers have opened eight assembly plants in the United States, creating almost 20,000 factory jobs. Now, Detroit is unionized, the southern plants are not. I mean, you just show people that math, and they, they were really shocked. The average person in Chattanooga was really shocked at these stats. And then my favorite quote from Reuters, and again, this is a third party Reuters analysis, not a right wing organization. Almost every job lost at US car factories in the last 30 years has occurred at a unionized company. When I read that, I thought to myself, how does everyone in Chattanooga not know that? And then I made it my mission to make sure that everyone <laughs> in Chattanooga knew that. 
And how did we do that? Well, <laughs> I bought a 50-foot billboard, for one, as you can see. Um, now, a lot of people will say that billboards aren't very effective. And um, maybe there's data to, to back that up, but in our case, I found our billboards to be tremendously effective. We bought, the first billboard I bought was last summer. It got national attention. I mean, the earned media we got from these billboards was tremendous. First of all, it's not a large town. Hamilton County is not that big. We placed, at the end, we had 13 billboards, including 11 digitals, which rotated messages every hour, different anti-union messages. And we placed them strategically on uh, locales where we know the workers would have to travel to get to the plant, but also in just general really high traffic areas where we know, you know, basically we wanted everyone to drive somewhere in Chattanooga every day and see one of our messages, and we were successful at that. And this was one of the most important messages. And again, what's so crucial about it is it did not come from a right-wing think tank. This is another one. <laughs> this is... Uh, Detroit brought to you by the UAW. This is another monster 50 foot by 14 billboard. What's pictured there is the Packard facility in the middle of Detroit, abandoned Packard plant. Uh, it's been abandoned for almost half a century. What happened to Packard Motors in Detroit is a really sad story. We wrote a long article about it for National Review if you want to check it out. It's called Empire of Rust. Packard was one of the many smaller auto companies uh, that existed during, during and slightly after World War II that the UAW aggressively organized and sabotaged at every level. Their supply chain, organizing strikes, and this was a time when GIs were coming back from the war and buying their first cars and becoming loyal to car brands for the first time. And so smaller companies like Packard, they couldn't afford to slash their prices like the big three could. So they, Packard could not afford the additional labor costs that the UAW was imposing on them, and so they, they just went away. It's really sad. And this empty plant has been sitting in the heart of Detroit for 50 years. It's a really sad symbol of the decline of both the city, but also a really powerful symbol, I think, about the, the really poisonous and detrimental nature of this organization. And then this, this was one of my favorites. The political activity of the UAW is really astonishing. They're openly progressive. They brag about helping elect liberal politicians. Bob King is Obama's best, best friend. You know, he brags about helping reelect him. They gave him $148,000 in 2012. Um, they brag about loving Obamacare and fighting against uh, repeals of Obamacare and, and amendments to Obamacare. But they don't want you to talk about that in the South. They want to be aggressively liberal nationally and fund national liberal politicians, of course, this really clashes with the values of most Tennessee voters and voters throughout the South. So we did, a we did this, we did a series of columns and op-eds and blog posts about politicians at the local level that the UAW had supported that were bad on gun rights, et cetera, stuff that's really of, of interest and, and really matters to people in the South. So they lost. Uh, what does this mean for the UAW? Well, it's not over, unfortunately. They've launched appeals and challenges to the verdict that the workers, and Ray is going to talk about that, Right to Work has been on top of that and is fighting that fight right now. Uh, beyond Chattanooga, I think what you're going to see is additional and aggressive pushes at the other southern auto plants. Mercedes in Alabama, I think, is really ripe for a new aggressive campaign. Because Bob King, when he steps down in, in the summer, he cannot go into that good night without having organized one of these facilities. And if they can't get it in Chattanooga, they're going to try, they're going to double down in, in Mercedes and in Nissan. Uh, again, this is a fight for their, for their existence. So, uh, And one more amendment, uh, addendum before I go. The next president of the UAW will likely be a man named Dennis Williams. Dennis Williams is an old-time labor boss. He led a strike against Caterpillar in the 90s, against Mitsubishi in the 80s. He has made public statements to the effect that he is not afraid to get confrontational. He is, if anything, even more political than Bob King is. In fact, he was an Obama campaign organizer in 2008 in Iowa. He was instrumental in helping Obama win that primary fight. Primary fight. So if King fails to get a, a plant organized by the summer, you're going to see the new president, Dennis Williams, 
really jettison that we're going to be nice approach that Bob King took, and I think you're going to see them get even more aggressive and even more political. So the fight is not over. We were happy to participate and to, to lend a voice, but this is they are not going away. And with that, I'd like to thank James, and thank you all for, for listening. Well, I'm a last-minute substitute for former NLRB member John Radebaugh, who is um, now a foundation staff attorney and uh, professor of La Reed Larson, professor of labor law at uh, Regent, uh, Ave Maria School of Law in, in Naples, Florida. Uh, John was part of the uh, three, actually four attorney team we uh, assigned to the VW Chattanooga case. Uh, the foundation, uh, we have 16 attorneys and uh, we, we don't engage in campaigning. What we do is provide legal advice and representation to workers who don't want to be represented by unions or who, where they're already represented by unions, do not want to uh, join or pay, pay money to unions as a condition of their employment. Uh, this has been a long, long battle in, in uh, the legal sense in Chattanooga, though not as long as some of the cases we've had. Uh, UAW was organizing in the plant and in the community for about two years. Uh, when they announced uh, that they had a majority on union authorization cards and demanded that VW recognize them. We were contacted by several of the VW workers who did not want the union, and uh, we filed on September 24 of last year, we filed unfair labor practice charges against the UAW for eight of those workers, uh, alleging uh, a number of things, uh, union coercion and misrepresentation to get signatures on the cards, People were, for example, told that uh, well, you're just signing the card uh, asking for an election. That doesn't mean you, you, you want us to be your representative. Uh, the uh, charges also alleged that the union was uh, refusing to uh, allow workers who had signed authorization cards to revoke those cards unless they came into the union office there in Chattanooga. And also, uh, and I have to remember, Last minute substitute, I don't remember exactly what the third aspect of that charge was. Uh, oh, they were using cards that had been signed uh, more than a year ago, which under board law means that they're stale and, and can't be counted. Um, subsequently, on October 16, we also filed unfair labor practice charges for, for several of those workers against the company. Uh, what uh, those charges alleged it was that the company was coercing workers into supporting the union. Uh, VW, and I think uh, Matt mentioned this, VW uh, Germany officials who also wear, who wear two hats, IG Metal has half of the positions on the supervisory board that makes decisions with regard to uh, location of production, uh, the, the, these German officials were announcing that, uh, well, we think that we need a works council at uh, Chattanooga, and the only way you can get a works council under American labor law is if the UAW is their monopoly bargaining representative. And uh, by the way, if uh, we don't have a works council there, maybe the next uh, line of production we schedule in North America will go to Mexico instead of Chattanooga. And we allege that those statements were unfair labor practice. Charge, uh, unfair labor practices, violating the National Labor Relations Act. At this point, uh, VW, which had not made it clear uh, whether it would recognize based on cards, as UAW was demanding, announced that it would uh, honor the employee's rights or uh, wishes in an election. So uh, I think we think that, uh, that the unfair labor practice charges had the effect of pushing VW into going for an election instead of just simply recognizing the union based on the the cards. Um, on uh, January 17, uh, the oh the the, region, uh, the way unfair labor practice charges work is you file them with the NLRB region. There are about 50 of them around the country. Ours were filed in uh, the Atlanta region, which has jurisdiction over uh, that part of Tennessee. And uh, the regional director had decided, rather than uh, determining whether he himself would issue a complaint against either VW or the UAW, sent them to what is called the Division of Advice in Washington, D.C. And on January 17, as we found out about a day later, 
the Division of Advice had issued a memo uh, telling the regional director to dismiss the charges. How did we find out about it? From a reporter. The, um, a reporter with the, one of the Chattanooga media. The uh, policy that the NLRB has followed for many, many years is that these Division of Advice memos are not public information. They're provided to the regions. Uh, you don't get them until a case is closed and then you have to file a Freedom of Information Act request to get them. So this was very, very unusual. Um, the next thing we got was the uh, dismissal of the charges by the regional director on January 23. And this was also uh, very interesting because the email by which the NLRB uh, Atlanta attorney sent the dismissals to us uh, had the whole string attached back and forth between the regional director in Atlanta complaining to the Division of Advice in Washington, D.C. about the fact that they learned about the dismissal, uh, uh, the, the memoranda, Division of Advice memoranda from a, another reporter, a Knoxville reporter, who told them that he had gotten it, uh, or rather he had gotten, had contacted the employer's attorney who hadn't received it yet. So, Washington, D.C. was sending out these memos to the press, not giving them to the parties in the case. And uh, the regional director, as I said, was complaining about the fact that, that Washington was not following uh, NLRB practice and procedure. Uh, we subsequently filed a letter uh, asking for the NLRB inspector general to investigate this departure from precedent. And we also made a Freedom of Information Act request for communications between uh, the uh, NLRB personnel and the union, because we suspect there was some hanky-panky going on, which will become even clearer as I uh, cover the subsequent events. Uh, the, the Division of Advice memoranda, one of the reasons it said that there, uh, the charges should be dismissed was that there was no neutrality agreement between UAW and VW. Uh, in fact, uh, Ten days after the, the Division of Advice memoranda were issued, there was a neutrality agreement reached between UAW and VW at a meeting in Germany. That's January 27. Oh, by the way, the uh, IG investigation and the FOI requests are still pending. They've asked for extensions of time to respond to us. Uh, the, the January 27, which was a Thursday, on Monday, February 3rd, VW files a petition for election with the board. This is very unusual. As Matt points out, usually it's a union asking for election, an employer resisting. Here the employer is asking for the election. Um, election was scheduled pursuant to the terms of the uh, neutrality agreement for nine days later, beginning on February 12th, uh, run for three days to the 14th. Uh, this is also unprecedented the speed with which this was done. How is it that the NLRB had the personnel available to hold an election nine days later? Usually it's uh, 20 or 30 days. We think, of course, that there was coordination not only between UAW and VW, but with, with the board. Uh, a, a group had been formed by, oh, and by the way, one of our clients was a guy named Mike Burton, who had a no to UAW uh, website, which was very effective in campaigning. We didn't advise him on the campaigning. We advised him on his legal rights, but he, he was one of the leaders of the group that fought the uh, UAW, and obviously he's one of our charging parties. He uh, w worked with others to set up a group called Southern Momentum, uh, w opposed to the union, which asked to attend the pre-election conference with the board. Uh, they were denied that opportunity. The election was held on uh, February 12 through 14, and as uh, Matt pointed out, uh, UAW lost 712 to 626. Uh, at this point, we decided not to appeal. We had asked for an extension of time on the right to appeal uh, the dismissal of our unfair labor practice charges. We decided not to appeal because we didn't want to give the board another reason, uh, a reason to, to hold a, a new election. The UAW filed objections to the results of the election on February 21. Uh, their objection basically was that uh, politicians, Tennessee politicians, including Senator Corker, had made statements against the union, including a statement by Senator Corker that, that he, uh, based on information he had, uh, if the 
a union lost, the, uh, the new production line would, would be put into Chattanooga. Of course, what he was doing was trying to rebut the statements by VW Germany officials, uh, who were also union officials, uh, that, that the union had to be in for the production to go there. Uh, we moved for five of our clients to intervene in the uh, objection proceedings on February 25. Southern Momentum moved on uh, a few days, a couple days later. The UAW opposed, obviously, intervention by both. Uh, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, given the circumstances, uh, the uh, VW, VW's attorney sent a letter to the board saying, we agree that there's no need to allow these workers to intervene. This is outrageous. The rights of the workers were being determined by this election, but they're not allowed to intervene in the proceedings to decide whether those uh, results are upheld or not. And that is standard board procedure and something that we think Congress should address by amending the act. Uh, intervention was granted, very unusual, by the regional uh, director on March 10th. The UAW immediately appealed. Uh, with a request for a special appeal to the board in Washington, D.C. Uh, the board, by the way, consists of three former union attorneys and, and two former management attorneys. So you can see <laughs> the deck is a little stacked there. Uh, we oppose the appeal. The, re the regional director, in the meantime, can uh, take one of three actions. Uh, he can decide to order a new election or not. He can hold a hearing and then decide whether to hold an election or not. And uh, the third option he has is to buck the decision on the matter to the board, which actually the, the UAW in its appeal has suggested. The final uh, action that we took in the case at, to this point is uh, shortly after the appeal was filed, we filed what is called a Section 302 action against U, U, UAW and VW. Uh, this is a federal court action in district court in Atlanta. Section 302 of the Labor Management Reporting uh, Act, Labor Management Relations Act, there's also a Labor Management Reporting Disclosure Act, so it's easy to get them confused. The LMRA, Section 302, prohibits employers from giving things of value to unions and unions accepting things of value. Uh, it's obviously intended to prevent corruption and collusion, which we think there is here. Uh, we won a case in the 11th Circuit uh, holding that uh, one of our clients could sue another union under that section. Uh, the union appealed to the Supreme Court, which uh, dismissed the writ of uh, certiorari as improvidently granted. So our precedent still is, still is standing that the employees can challenge and courts can find that these types of deals are illegal. The things of value we allege in the complaint are the access to the plant that UAW was given by by VW, the captive audience speeches, the employees were required to attend meetings at which the union officials, or the union organizers made their pitch. And, oh, the employees could leave, by the way. They were free to leave after management spoke. But, of course, who's taking notes as to who's going out? And incidentally, at those meetings, uh, our clients attended. They tried to ask questions, and they were not, the UAW organizers wouldn't answer any questions. Uh, the other provisions of the neutrality agreement that we're challenging as a, uh, unlawful things of value is the gag order on management personnel. Uh, some of the management personnel didn't want the union, but they were not free to speak. And actually, there were <coughs> the agreement include, included a, re a requirement that VW and UAW coordinate their public comments about the situation. Uh, the quid pro quo was that the union agreed to concessions on wages and benefits if they become exclusive bargaining representative. Uh, but essentially what they agreed was that they wouldn't ask for any better wages or benefits than the UAW workers in Detroit were getting. And uh, the, uh, there was a no-strike clause. Of course, that action uh, is going to take some time to litigate, we're, but we're asking for an injunction against further uh, enforcement of the neutrality agreement should there be a uh, revote. And that's where it stands. Thank you, Ray. So I, I find it, again, very striking that uh, you have, you know, you know, Matt come down to Tennessee, you, you conversations with workers, a few billboards, and, you know, to, you know, to listen to the, you know, the unions that presented, that that's, you know, this you know, vast right-wing conspiracy, 
that you know, you, you deceives the workers and, uh, and you persuades them not to unionize. What, what I, I find so striking about this, though, is if the union had a product worth selling, if a, the union had a quality product that the workers wanted to buy, I don't think a few billboards going up around town with uh, quotes from news articles and pictures from Detroit would have been enough to dissuade them from joining. And yet it was. And that tells me that the union is selling a product that many workers uh, simply aren't as interested in purchasing in today's economy. And I think that makes a lot of sense, because our economy has changed quite dramatically from the 1930s when our labor laws were first written. And they really haven't been substantively modified since 1947 uh, with the Taft-Hartley Act. That since the, uh, the economy of the 1930s and the 1940s, individual skills have become far more important uh, in the workplace. In a knowledge economy, it's what a worker individually uh, brings with his talents and his abilities uh, to the table. That uh, you don't really have workers as interchangeable cogs on the assembly line. Uh, or even if you look at a, an assembly line factory these days, that it, it involves you far greater degrees of uh, individual uh, your, your talents and skills. And the, uh, the production methods that were brought to the South by uh, many of these uh, non-union facilities involved having team production methods where any uh, one member of the team should be able to substitute uh, out for other members and have the ability to exercise not just doing the same task over and over again, but many different tasks w within, the, uh, within the operation of the facility. And you've also had along with that a trend towards a much more flattened hierarchy, that it used to be a, a, a much more rigid distinction between management and labor that uh, management would simply tell the workers what to do, and the workers would follow uh, uh, the directions with almost no, uh, no changes or, or thought of their own. This was the, uh, the famous Taylorism, that uh, Taylor was a man who would, who would basically, uh, with his stopwatch, he'd stand out and you track the most efficient way of, say, laying mortar and, and bricks on a wall, and basically would come up with the, the most time efficient means of doing it, and then the worker's sole job would be to spend their entire day doing exactly what uh, Taylor had laid out. There are not many workplaces that operate like that anymore. Workers today, even uh, what we term rank and file workers, are expected to exercise a far greater degree of, uh, of discretion and judgment uh, than uh, was the case 50, 60 years ago. And as the, the workplace has changed to require more individual skills and to have a more flattened hierarchy with more uh, individual uh, discretion and responsibility at the level of the individual workers, we've seen a shift in attitudes in the workplace that uh, most workers today don't think that they're locked in any sort of class conflict with their employer. In fact, if you take a look at uh, polling done by uh, Richard Freeman, who's a, a very uh, prominent uh, labor economist and uh, he also does uh, work on uh, labor history at Harvard, uh, by no means a uh, conservative, I, I would hasten to add. But if you look at uh, a polling and research he's done, he finds that most workers believe that they and their uh, company are on the same side. They don't view themselves as locked in a war with management. They view that when their company does well, they do well. And when their company does badly, they do badly. And this is also borne out by polling by other organizations. That uh, Gallup polling finds that roughly 80% of workers say they're satisfied with their, uh, their job, that they like their boss, that they feel respected and recognized for their accomplishments at work. In a workplace where those are the, the dominant attitudes of the workers, it's a very difficult sell to tell them, hey, we'd like to offer you adversarial collective bargaining which is what the unions have been selling. This is basically the same product that they've been selling since the 1930s when they organized uh, General Motors. That uh, we are going to you know, come up and have an economy uh, where we're going to fight against your management. And most workers today don't want to buy that. Polls show that only about one in 10 non-union workers want to organize. And so even in Chattanooga, when the union was trying to organize the plant, that was not what they were you know, going to try and offer the workers. What they said they wanted was a works council. Well, what is a works council? A works council is a, a, a basically a, a legal environment uh, whereby workers uh, can elect or you know, somehow select representatives who will meet with management uh, to discuss uh, basically matters of concern. What's going on with the benefits in the workplace? You know, how would we like to see those benefits changed? Are there workplace policies that, uh, that need to be overhauled that aren't working very efficiently? It's an institutional formal framework for worker representatives and management representatives to get together and discuss issues of common concern uh, to both of them. But there was a problem in Chattanooga. Volkswagen couldn't simply create a works council. Legally, they were not allowed to say, all right, we would like to meet with our workers, meet with worker representatives elected by the, the rank-and-file employees in the shop, and we'd like to discuss how we can uh, streamline operations, you know, smooth over anything that the workers are feeling uh, isn't working right. We'd like to discuss with them how can we make this a better uh, place to work and a better company to work at. You cannot do that legally 
unless the workers are unionized. Now, why would that be? Why would Congress pass this? Well, back in the 1930s, when they passed the National Labor Relations Act, they were very concerned about companies creating basically fake company unions. So that if the UW was going to come knocking on the door trying to organize a company, the company would create their own union. And so, no, no, you don't need to sign on with the UAW because you've got our, you know, Acme Corporation union. You, know, you know, sign on with them. And uh, they were, Congress was concerned this would be used as a tool to deter organizing drives. Well, that may be an valid concern of the 1930s. But in today's economy, when less than 7% of workers in the private sector belong to a union, what this restriction in practice means is that you can either join a union and formally speak to your employer through a, a union and the, the traditional collective bargaining process, or you can't have a formal voice on the job. Well, in an economy when only one in 10 workers say they want to unionize, when the union has a well-deserved reputation for being harmful to the companies they've organized. I mean, my uh, family lives in the Detroit suburbs. I've seen the, the devastation wrought on Detroit. You, you drive through that city, and it is, you, know, you think it's been a war zone or a wasteland of some sort. It's, I, I mean, it's, it's horrific what's, what's happened to that town. And in an economy where a lot of workers you know, simply don't want to join a union, if you have a law that says you either join a union or you can't have a formal voice on the job, then that means that for the vast majority of workers, they're simply not going to have any voice on the job. Because many, 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 many workers don't want to sign on with their products like that which the OW is, uh, is selling. You take a poll, the Rasmussen has done this, a number of organizations have done this, and ask your workers, your non-union workers, would you like to join a union? You get about 10% saying yes. It's not that surprising they're not getting to a 50% plus one in, uh, in all that many uh, companies. But I think this is very harmful to both workers and to the economy. Because in many cases, companies would like to hear from their workers. You think of the, the name, human resources. That embodies this dramatic shift in, uh, in management philosophy since the 1970s. Companies today tend to think of workers as a valuable resource. They want to keep their workers satisfied. They want to be able to attract the top talent. If they've got good workers, they want to be able to retain them. They want to motivate them to work hard. And you do this by treating them with respect, taking care of concerns that arise in the workplace. Now, if you've got a, a company with you know, tens of thousands of employees around the world like Volkswagen does, how is senior management possibly going to know what's going on at the rank and file level? They just don't have that information available to them. That's where the value of something like a works council or an employee involvement program comes in. And yet, if you do this, it's illegal unless you're willing to be unionized. And most companies, you know, unlike Volkswagen, uh, most uh, companies do not have unions with seats on the board of directors and are not going to welcome in an institution like the UAW uh, because of uh, internal pressure. And so most companies are not going to be you know, encouraging their workers to unionize. Most companies are going to look warily at the you know, companies like, uh, like uh, Hostess that uh, recently went bankrupt, like you know, uh, General Motors and, uh, and Chrysler, you know, like U.S. Steel, like Bethlehem Steel, like the long list of unionized companies that have gone bankrupt and say, we don't want to be added to that list. And you know, most of those companies are within the bounds of the law going to try and encourage their workers not to unionize. And yet what you wind up with is a situation where the, the, the workers are, are, it's an all or nothing choice. The law, this is an anachronism. There's no reason to have this. There was a company called uh, Electromation. It was a, uh, an automotive company in the 1980s. And uh, what they did is uh, they uh, made a change to their, uh, their uh, basically they had a, an attendance bonus, where they, if you had a perfect attendance record, they would uh, they'd give you a bonus. And they were going to make some changes to the bonus system. And the workers were just very upset by this. They were just, no, 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 no we like the old system, don't change this. And management felt absolutely blindsided. They had no idea that the, the, the workers would be upset by this. So they created a bunch of action committees who were basically worker representatives and management representatives who uh, would get together. And management said, hey, if you can identify ways to make this workplace uh, work better, if you can do it in a way that's not going to raise our costs that much, we'll commit to implementing all these changes. Worked very well. The workers were happy. You know, the management was happy. They were fixing problems they didn't even know they had until the National Labor Relations Board came in, in, a, in legal Greek uh, circles, it's a, a famous case, Electromation Incorporated v. NLRB, uh, forced them to uh, shut it down. This ought not be happening in today's economy anymore. And so what I would suggest is that if there are concerns about uh, the, uh, the creation of fake unions and company unions, we can deal with that by modifying the National Labor Relations Act to say that you can't have any employer-dominated labor organizations that act as collective bargaining representatives of the workers. Works councils don't do that. Employee involvement and employee participation programs, there's no collective bargaining agreement you're, you're going to sign. So if you're concerned 
about uh, management creating fake unions that would negotiate contracts instead of a real union. Yeah, continue to pray about that. I don't think that's much of a concern. I think that's an anachronism. But be that as it may, you let that be the prohibition. But don't shut down the entire realm of uh, other uh, other uh, uh, mechanisms that workers can express their voice on the job. I mean, if a company wants to listen to their workers, if it wants to take their concerns into account and try and create a more attractive uh, work environment, Congress not be, ought not be trying to shut that down and prevent that from happening. I mean, the goal of Congress ought not be we'll give you guys such a, a miserable work environment that you'll, you'll sign on with the union as your only alternative. I mean, that, you know, that, that ought not be the thought process. The thought process ought to be we want the best environment for workers. If they have an, a, a works council and they want to unionize, they can vote to unionize. But if they you know, have a works council and they're satisfied with that, they don't want a union, they, you know, that ought to be the case. And if workers don't want any of them, you know, let that be the case as well. We ought to be having a a labor law that is tailored to the modern economy, not the economy that uh, used to exist uh, you know, back in the 1930s, but uh, has not been uh, a very good description of our economy for a very long time now. And uh, with that, uh, we're uh, happy to take any questions we have from the audience. This may be a little bit more for Matt, but the others. I'm still curious why they were so optimistic in what has been noted as a right-to-work state that this vote might be a shoe-in. Was there any, com was it complacency because people have just not thought about right-to-work and the labor issues so much in this area? Was there any experience from the Saturn plant, which is a GM plant in Tennessee, versus the ones that have come in from the outside? A couple of reasons. I think, number one, Hello. <laughs> um, for one, Chattanooga is in Tennessee, which is a right-to-work state. Uh, however, that part of southeastern Tennessee has historically more pro-union sentiment than the rest of the state. Uh, that was a very fortuitous circumstance for the union, and that's something I didn't learn until I started going down there for a long time. Uh, so there was more of a, an accepting climate unions in Chattanooga than the rest of the state. Number two, Volkswagen, the pressure put on it by its union back in Germany was crucial. And that's something that you didn't see in other places. They had tried to organize Nissan, for example, Mercedes. You just didn't have that type of internal pressure coming from the company. Uh, and number three, I think they had complete access to the workers. You know. The company gave the union an office in the plant. They had a captive audience. The, the workers were getting this UAW propaganda pretty much daily for years. Um, and I think they underestimated the resistance from the community. They thought that if they just had the workers captive, then that would be enough. But I think stirring up the debate about the history of the union and its political agenda, I think it really caught the union unawares because they certainly didn't push back on it in any real significant way. So I can only s assume that they thought that that wouldn't matter as long as they had the workers in their, cor in their jaws, <laughs> as you can say. So for all those reasons, I think they overestimated their chances. However, uh, it is certainly true that they had more going for them in Chattanooga than they had had at any place else in the South for sure. Cole Stangler from In These Times magazine. I have a question for Matt. Um, so you guys were referencing the group Southern Momentum before, which raised uh, about $100,000 um, fighting the union. I'm wondering, uh, Matt, if you were paid at all by Southern Momentum for the work that you did uh, down there? No. Okay. Zero. And in, and in fact, just an addendum to that, I, I had been working in Chattanooga on this issue for a long, long time before Southern Momentum was formed. And by the way, speaking of Southern Momentum, I just have to say, they are the heroes. I mean, those were the workers. Uh, Mike Burton, who led that organization, he moved uh, heaven and earth to make sure his colleagues got the information that they needed in spite of the union and the company putting up every roadblock in their path. So they are the real heroes of this, in my opinion. I'll second that. 
on some of the news reports, you know, I think it talked about some of the articles where some of the anti-union workers kind of pointed to an article in the contract saying that there was language in the contract saying that there wouldn't be any gains from wages or wage differential, uh, basically saying that you'd be joining the union but wouldn't get this huge pay bump. Uh, was that as effective as it sounded like up here in kind of the uh, uh, Washington area media? And can you talk a little bit more about the effect of kind of the anti-union workers and kind of how effective they were? I, I'm not sure <clears throat> any one uh, one f factor was the reason for the way the vote came out. I think you had a, a lot of different factors. Uh, you have to start with the fact that Southerners are pretty independent. You have to factor in the fact that the UAW really overreached. The UAW organizers were running around the plant in black t-shirts. I mean, can you imagine the psychological effect of that on Southern workers? Yeah, I, I mean, just to pick up on that point, it, people say, oh, the, the UAW were, uh, members, they were just having a tour of the plant in their black UAW t-shirts. I always like to say to people, well, imagine if you were going to vote in an election and one of the candidates stood behind you the week before you were to vote in a black t-shirt and watched you work. That's classic intimidation. That's classic union thug tactics. And it really rubbed, I think, a lot of the workers the wrong way, absolutely. And I think Detroit was a big factor. What, what happened with the big three in Detroit, UAW, uh, that's, we certainly heard more comments about that from our clients than anything else. Uh, I, I think you're referencing the, the provision in the neutrality agreement uh, which is one of the things that we say is a, a quid pro quo for the for the organizing assistance that VW gave to the union, and we're alleging that that's corrupt to say if we get in, we become a monopoly bargaining representative. We're not going to ask what the workers want. Yeah, I'll just do one more thing on that. The biggest factor I think in the union losing this was the behavior and history of the union. Period. The more people learned about the behavior and history of the union, the more repulsed they were. Um, one message that I don't think has been addressed is the secret ballot election. And can you guys talk about that fight? That was kind of a big move for this plant and this uh, union that this was a secret ballot election. Well, that's, that's what our clients wanted was the secret ballot election. Uh, Obviously, we, when we file unfair labor practice charges, we put out a press release uh, and publicize it with the media. And the point we made to the media was UAW was demanding rep recognition by VW based on defective cards, cards that had been obtained through misrepresentation and coercion, which, by the way, no one has ever seen those cards except the UAW organizers. Yeah. So we don't even know if they really had a majority. We do know that one of the union organizers made the mistake of telling the press uh, before VW asked for an election that, that they, they were concerned that they would lose if there was an election. They wanted recognition based on the cards. We filed the unfair labor practice charges, and shortly thereafter, VW said, Uncle, we're going to ask for an election. We're not going to recognize based on cards. Yeah, I'd just add as a matter of policy, this shows that why uh, legislation like the so-called Employee Free Choice Act would have been so destructive. That when it came down to the secret ballot vote, uh, the workers voted down the union. And that, you know, it's a secret ballot, you know, no one knows how you're going to vote. Uh, that's the, the freest and fairest way to express your preference without fear of any sort of retaliation. But had the union simply been able to submit the cards, assuming they weren't, uh, you know, uh, misrepresenting the state of the cards uh, in what they said in the press, then those workers would have been organized. And uh, I think that shows why the union movement wants uh, card checks so, uh, so desperately, is that it makes organizing a lot easier. But I, I think so it, it does that at the expense of the workers and their rights. If workers are not willing to vote for a union and don't want to join a union uh, in the privacy of the voting booth, then you want not be trying to get them into a union if the only way you can organize them is by uh, you know, making sure that you know, they know and the union knows exactly who's going to sign on and who's not signing on. That's, you know, that sort of pressure is not something people should be put through. Yeah, and just to go back to the previous question, this is another example of the behavior of the union turning off so many people in the town. 
when the union says we don't think the workers should have a secret ballot because that would be divisive, which is what they said, w what does that mean? That, that means they don't want people to have a private vote, um, and that just rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Everyone knows that the best way to ensure the integrity of an election is to make sure that the votes are private uh, and that there's no intimidation that way. Unions don't want that. They don't want you to have that right. And I, I agree. I don't think they ever had enough cards. They certainly said they did. They had enough cards to get in, but I don't believe they ever did. However, I do think that the company believed that they did, and that that may be the only reason they agreed to a secret ballot was because they thought it was a shoe-in. Um, but I'm really glad that they had that opportunity for the secret ballot, and, and certainly every worker should have that right. I mean, it, it makes sense. If, if, if you go in to vote for president and both of the candidates are standing behind you in the voting booth again, you're not going to feel comfortable to make the decision that your conscience um, decides. So. In terms of the statistics, uh, unions win about 60% of the elections supervised by the National Labor Relations Board. When they have a neutrality ag agreement, it goes up to uh, about 75%. When they have neutrality plus card check, it goes up to about 80%. Yeah. Uh, we have time for uh, one more question. Thank you. Uh, Gideon from the Wilson Center. Uh, I'd like to ask James about uh, your mention about the last stage. Uh, I think you have said that the labor union uh, that runs with a traditional principle kills, like, kills flexibility and a creativity of every individual workers to make their, uh, maximize their performance. And then do you think that like to make a new move or atmosphere uh, to create uh, their, uh, maximizing their performance and creati creativity can make it possible to uh, empowering the industry or increasing the uh, comparative ad ad uh, advantage of like a uh, car, like industry in the here without like labor costs uh, control like labor cost, labor cost cut. Or well, I think, uh, and this is uh, going back to Richard Freeman's. Uh, he had a, a classic work called uh, "What Do Unions Do?" that came out in the, the mid 1980s, and he describes that unions do basically two different things in the workplace. Uh, the the one side of it is the collective bargaining, which we're all you know, fairly familiar with, where they negotiate a contract that covers everyone, and that's really where I think they uh, run into a lot of problems. By definition, a collective contract does not recognize individual workers' uh, talents and their abilities. Uh, almost by definition, collectively, you're not going to reward individual contributions. And that's where I, I think a lot of workers are turned off now by this idea, that they want to be able to not stand in line in a, a seniority system, but actually work and, and get ahead. And uh, you know, at the same time, a lot of companies just you know, you're pulling out the hair because they have the inefficiencies of this you know, collective contract. But it, it, you know, that's sort of one side of what unions do. The other side of what they do is uh, provide a formal voice and a, a vehicle for workers to uh, express their uh, views and concerns in the workplace. And uh, in Freeman's, uh, his analysis, he uh, viewed that the, uh, the uh, he called the monopoly face of the union was harmful, but that the, uh, the voice face was beneficial. And he thought that the benefits from the voice side of the union outweighed the, the downsides of the, the monopoly face. I think the subsequent 30 years have demonstrated that that's you know, probably not the case, that the, uh, the, the unions, uh, unionized companies simply do not have an advantage in the marketplace, that the, the costs of the, uh, the collective bargaining and the inefficiencies there outweigh whatever benefits from the, uh, the increased uh, information and, uh, and voice uh, for the workers helping you streamline your operations. But I do think for policymakers, it's a, a very good thing that we uh, you know, ought to be encouraging Congress to think about that what are other ways to advocate and to, uh, to increase the voice of workers? You know, you to facilitate that uh, communication of, uh, of information. If there's problems going on at the ground level, how is senior management supposed to know that? How are they supposed to hear that from the workers? If you're talking about a relatively small enterprise, it's you know, not a big deal. Uh, if you're talking about an enterprise with several thousand or tens of thousands of workers, you're going to have several layers of, of uh, bureaucracy in between the, the guys on the ground floor and uh, senior management. And uh, you'll have things you know, happen, like you know, what happened with the electromation. I, you know, granted, they were a smaller shop, but where they were making changes to the benefits, the workers vehemently resisted. And they just they felt blindsided. They had no idea that uh, you know, this was not going to be a, uh, a well-received policy. And so that's uh, part of what we're suggesting here with the uh, relaxing the 82 ban to allow things like works councils and employee participation programs. In an environment where most workers are saying they don't want to join a union, 
let's try and find other uh, mechanisms for workers to have a voice on their job, to have their voice heard, and to try and work cooperatively uh, with companies. Uh, I mean, most companies today want to attract and retain a quality workforce. They want their workers to be happy. They want this to be a selling point when they're trying to recruit workers from other companies and uh, to try and discourage their existing workers from, uh, from jumping ship to a competitor. And we ought not have legal barriers in place that prevent them from having that in place. The, le the legal problem now is that it can't be two-way. Yeah. Uh, you can have a company can have a suggestion box where employees can mm -hmm. make suggestions. Uh, they, they can have form their own committees and they could, you know, send a petition to the employer. But the two-way responding yeah. to that, the employer can't sit down and talk with them. Yeah. That's the problem with the law today. Yeah, it's an anachronism, and I just, I don't see any place for it. You, no one's concerned about company unions being formed today. The problem with the, G, the VW Works Councils is that those are uh, committees which consist of both uh, workers who are in the bargaining unit, blue-collar workers so normally, and uh, the people who are in the offices. It's, it's everybody. So you're, you're, you've got the two-way there. Uh, James, we did have one online question, if you don't mind summing okay. up with it. Uh, what is going to stop the National Labor Relations Board from invalidating the vote and allowing a revote? And if so, what's your next step? I, I think that's one I should answer. The legal uh, answer is nothing. There is no appeal to federal court from a decision of the National Labor Relations Board in a uh, representation election case. Yeah, and just from our point of view, uh, the Center for Worker Freedom is not leaving Chattanooga. They've made it, the UAW has made it obvious that they're not leaving and that they're going to try again as soon as they can, and we are not leaving either. The union made a, a lot of hay about the outsiders coming in from D.C. or whatever to, to fight this fight, and I always say, hey, you were the first and biggest outsider there from Detroit. I'll leave if you will. So we're staying. We're going to keep our message up, and um, we're going to continue to communicate with uh, with the people of Chattanooga. Right, and, and our 302 action is designed that we can't appeal the revote, but we can stop the collusion between management, between VW and the UAW, if we're successful in our uh, 302 suit, where we get injunctive relief telling them not to give organizing assistance to the union. All right, well, thank you, everyone.